Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of our conference as we seek to develop collaborative solutions to reduce the impact of climate change, especially on vulnerable people, and in particular, the workers in the Caribbean. We're going to start this morning with a recap of yesterday, which was rich in its learning and its knowledge products. And we thought it would be useful for us just to review those and which would help us set the, the tone and frame the discussion for today. And that should be very valuable to the persons who um, were unable to join us yesterday. Uh, we couldn't help but talk among ourselves of how the weather of yesterday made real for us the realities the, of what we seeking to address in this, um, in this meeting. So to help us recap, we'll be, um, I will be introducing my dear friend, Dr. Spencer Linus uh, Thomas. Spence holds a doctor of philosophy in economics from Howard University. He is also a qualified and experienced telecoms regulator. It's kind of difficult to go into all that he does, but I think I can summarize it to tell you that Spence came to us on Tuesday having left Senegal on Sunday, overnighted in Miami on Monday, and came to us on Tuesday. He was in Senegal for how long, Spence? For five days, uh, doing preparatory work as a member of several of the Bureau for COP27. And at the end of this month, he leaves for about three weeks to Egypt to attend COP27, where he is literally one of the most respected persons in that, in that area. He served on finance committees, as I said, members, as a member of the Bureau. And um, in honor of Spence, about four years ago, he was in Egypt, and you see me modeling the benefit of my friendship with, 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 um, with Spence. That's a good brother. And Spence, I want you to know that both Sadika, Dr. Khan, and Ashaki, Dr. Do, when they heard you were going back to Egypt, and I told them where I got this shirt from, they expect their gifts. So Sads and, um, and Shaki, <laughs> but, but, but Spencer is a delightful human being, committed to the cause of contributing to save our planet and to save humanity. And so it's with a sense of deep affection and pride that I bring you Dr. Spencer Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Henry, and good morning to everyone. And thank you for your kind invitation to be here to give this perspective on what happened yesterday. And I thank you for this quite very generous introduction. Uh, at one point, I was wondering who you were talking about, but um, thank you very much. Um, my task is very simple this morning. I had a task yesterday, and I have a task this morning. I was supposed to have spoken yesterday for half hour, and this 
morning for half hour. So this, unfortunately, you'll have to listen to me for one hour. So, but um, just to wrap up from, I think we had a, a very good day yesterday. We had a very um, complimentary presentations, if I may add. And um, I asked some questions as what happened yesterday. The words that I heard um, were insightful, depressing, passionate, sobering, and even I heard tragic narrative. Um, that was the dis dis distribution of the, of the thinking that we heard with respect to those presentations yesterday. I think one of, the, I, I, one of the tragic narrative they were talking about specifically had to do with the presentation um, from, from Candy White. I think it was a very sobering and, and, and um, very tragic um, presentation in a way. But I want to say also, I hope that um, Brother Steve um, Maxime is listening to us because as the father of this meeting, I think the only tragic narrative was he is not been here. So, um, so um, I hope that he is listening to us. Um, of course, we had the keynote yesterday um, by Dr. Rankin and uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, double keynote shows the importance of this very important topic for us. And they were introduced, of course, by, by um, Dr. Henry, who in indicated very clearly that what we're doing here is not a one-off. It's something that we need to, to perfect as we go along and, um, and that it's, we need some real tangible output. And I think we did get some tangible output yesterday. And I, I'm sure that we are going to get some tangible output today. Um, so the two introductory presentations were done by Dr. Um, Henry, as I indicated, and also Dr. Dennis Zulu from um, ILO and Mr. Fraser from OSF. And I think they, again, they provided the context of this, of this, of this um, discussion very clearly. And some key issues came out of this initial speaking and initial presentations. What we found and what we heard very clearly was that there is a global shift from fossil fuel to a low carbon future. Uh, based on renewable energy, of course. And then we must make that shift. But to do so, we cannot leave any worker behind. We cannot leave any community behind. Um, so this is a just transition that we're talking about. Must be inclusive and must be characterized by fairness. Of course, we understand very clearly that climate change is one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing now and the biggest obstacle to climate justice. And that climate change is real. We had the evidence, the evidence of climate impacts across the globe abounds. We don't have to repeat them. We heard them very clearly. We also heard that workers and community must be at the center of the, of the, of the climate problem and must be part of the solution of addressing climate. Must be workers, must be at the forefront of the solutions. So climate change is about people. We heard that yesterday, more, over and over. And, it, and at the same time, it's the climate justice is also about people. Now we heard from, from Dr. Rankin on the, on the science, and he spent a lot of time on the science, the 1.5 degree threshold, IPCC science, and even some traditional knowledge. But in final analysis, the summation was workers and community must wise up and i think that framing was particularly important they must wise up they must heads up and they must wake up wise up because of the current situation that we're facing it's abounds the climate impact abounds all over we can see it in terms of temperatures sea level rise um, extreme ever events rainfall patterns and so on it's abounds so we must at least wise up to this current environment we must have a heads up on the predictions that we are facing in terms of what will happen in the future. It is very clear, uh, the predictions, the models that have been done, climate studies group have done the, the modeling for the Caribbean, and they, they have explained exactly what we are going to expect over the next um, period. And of course, we must wake up. The idea here is we need to see what is happening. We know what is going to be coming, so we need to act now. And I think that was a very clear framing, what was done by Dr. Rankin in terms of how we can move forward 
in terms of climate justice and climate, climate, um, climate change. It's clearly indicated that we are in unprecedented climate, we are in unprecedented impacts, so we need unprecedented response to address the climate problem. We must, we must mitigate, we must adapt, and we must educate. I think this was a big one. We must have a sustained education program, a sustained education agenda to address the question of climate change and climate justice. No time to waste, a very clear conclusion. We heard again from, from, from Lloyd, who's sitting right here, about the interlinkages between climate justice and social justice. And we understand clearly from his presentation that everything is interconnected. The vulnerable groups are going to get larger as we go forward. And climate change is a multiplier of risk to workers and communities. And that we are facing the multiple compounded, overlapping and cascading risk and impacts to climate change. And it has serious impacts on workers and communities. And that we must have locally grown solutions. We heard that again pervading throughout the, um, the representation yesterday. And of course, we look at some of the, 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 the sectors, the linkages, um, agriculture, cultural heritage, indigenous peoples, local communities, ecosystem-based adaptation. And we found that all of these are interrelated and interconnected. Very real connections. The concept of sustainable use was, was, was clearly identified in some of the presentations. And of course, the importance of traditional knowledge and local communities. So I think, based on all the presentation yesterday, we need to really thank Kishan Kumar Singh for that lovely presentation. Um, Dr. Shelley Gomes, Dr. Mr. Colin Mendoza, Ms. Candy White, I mentioned that, that presentation already, Fallon Lutchman Singh, Kemba Jaram Mungi, if I got it right. Of course, Steve Maximi, I hope he is listening. Um, and Kara Rumsing and Barry Fakori. Again, I need to say thank you to all of the presentations from yesterday. I think it was fantastic. All linked to one another and brought us to a single thing. And of course, it tells us and it tells Dr. Henry that very tangible output will be coming out from this great conference so far. Some of the other key issues that, that I wanted to recognize also had to do with the definition of just transition. We had a, it was very clear from the presentation that we, we ought not to, to be fixated with any particular definition on climate um, and just transition. But that there are some elements we heard clearly from Carlin and from Steve of the whole question of distributive justice, procedural justice, restorative justice, and recognitive justice. Of course, we could say all of those things, but what does that really mean um, to the workers and the working community? I think that is the issue. But what it comes down to is that the failure to achieve just transition could be catastrophic for the labor, catastrophic for the worker and for the communities. And that just transition really is a bridge from where we are to a different future, a future with green jobs, a future with decent work, a future where poverty is eradicated, where communities are striving and resilient communities be the result, a future which is embedded and consistent with uh, the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And a critical element of that future must be social discourse as an imperative. So that's what we heard very clearly. And in terms of what going forward, what we need we heard that we need a transformative shift, a transformative shift in our behavior, that we need to have holistic approaches, whole of society approaches. We need retooling. We heard retooling, we heard reschooling, we heard reskilling, we heard we need a paradigm shift to a low carbon development, a paradigm shift to a low carbon development. We heard clearly, and I think Kishan put some key areas, about nine key areas which I thought most of the other presentation were gravitating around them. First, we need investment in institutional frameworks as we go forward to handle the issue of climate change and climate justice. We need to have full integration, my number two, full integration. 
Number three, we need to have effective stakeholder engagement. And we need to have a comprehensive societal awareness program. Number five, we need to have worker support mechanism. I think that was critical, worker support mechanisms. And I think we could, we could disaggregate this into, into, into various forms. Of course, gender equality and gender issues came up in many of the presentations that we had yesterday. Education is a critical issue. Education towards a low carbon um, economy was also a key feature of the presentation. And that we need to look at some of the sectors and get deep into the sector, so sectoral analysis. And his final area was actually the incentives framework, which will be required as we move forward to this just transition. We heard from Dr. Gomes, and I want to, I want to just mention whole, the whole question of gender injustice and climate within the Anthropocene era and the adverse impacts of human activity uh, with the complex dynamics of human dominance over nature. We heard that piece of work, really seminal piece of work being done. But what I took out of it from her was it's soil, not oil. I think that was a very cute way to sum up um, the, the presentation for Dr. Gomes. It is soil, not oil. I think we also heard again from, from, from Carlon Mendoza, who spoke about climate justice, ecosystem-based adaptation, indigenous peoples, and the policy and regulatory framework. Again, um, again, reinforcing some of the themes that we have already indicated. Um, I can't leave here without saying a word on the presentation by Candy White from North Dakota, the case study that she had, um, basically, talking about just transition in the context of how do you fight to protect your air, soil, and water. And that some of the consequences of the, of, 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 of the en environment in, in the case study with respect to the reduced agricultural productivity, accidents and deaths, the kind of pollution that we heard, the fish kill, the fish kill, the, the, the health impacts, the dumping, pollution, um, the water security issues, equality issues. And I mean, the case study was, again, we, we heard that it was a tragic narrative. And I think that was a good um, description of that presentation. But what came out of it was that the system change is required, not climate change is the issue. She really asked for a system change, a lifestyle change. And again, the call for self-determination initiatives from that community as we move forward. Indigenous peoples will be part of the just transition um, architecture. And of course, we had a very important panel. Uh, my friend Steve, I think this was well balanced. And I want to thank Cara for balancing Steve in, in that presentation, because we heard some very profound impacts and, 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 and statements from Cara. I can't say that about Steve. But, um, but I think for, Cara did a good job to, to really balance this, this, this thing very well. Um, but I have to agree with a couple of things that Steve said, despite that. He said that um, agriculture is not the villain. Now, of course, we know Steve is the villain. It's not agriculture. But I think I agree also that um, agriculture is the hub. I think he used a very cute statement, hub of radiating spokes. Of course, we all know in our region, the importers of agriculture, the importers of soil, nutrition, uh, national security, all those linkages which he brought very clearly, which I think was fundamental to the issue of, of just transition. So thank you very, Steve, for this very um, enlightening presentation. And that panel was a very active one, of course. So, and he mentioned also the old question of land use policy. And I, I don't know if he, he was looking for money because he said we need to monetize the cultural and heritage varieties and so on. And that was his last response yesterday. And, and, and finally, the last presentation, um, Brother Barry Faruqi, I think, and speaking on the whole question of climate change and, and, and um, manufacturing, and dig, digging deep into the whole question of the circular economy. I think it was, it was quite an enlightening presentation. Um, I think what we found out, what we heard clearly, was just transition policies are needed across the Caribbean. And of course, um, he said very clearly, and I agree, we cannot buy our way out of the climate problem. But finally, I want to say that I have to agree 
with the keynote who said, and I agree, that we have to rise up, we need to heads up, and we need to wake up. And that time is not on our side. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Spence. Um, I'm going to be turning over moderation to my colleague Ian Daniel, but before we do so, I want to invite Christian Zakur. Christian is an environmental advocate and she has some interesting information that she would like to share with us concerning a grant for loss and damage activities that has been provided by the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. Christian. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am part of a youth board to the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. We are made up of members from the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, and together we have put out a grant to finance loss and damage activities around the world. Um, because loss and damage activities up to this point have been capacity building, education, advocacy, but nothing particularly on the ground, and we want to start changing that. So we are financing one big activity of, um, that will take up to six to 12 months to put into place, that will be 50,000 USD, and 10 small activities of um, one to six months, that will be 10,000 USD each, so that's 11 activities that we will be financing. It is open to everybody around the world, but I want to get some Caribbean representation in there because um, we're not very well represented. And um, I have a QR code to access the guidelines, if you could put that up, please. If not, I will just have to share it on the Zoom. I'll just have to share it later because we have a long day ahead. Um, I really want to encourage all of you to apply or if not to share it. It is open to um, youth organizations who are taking part in um, loss and damage activities. All of the guidelines and stipulations are available on the the website that will be shared on the QR code. But um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And now I'll be turning over the podium to Ian Daniel. Ian is our program dean for labor studies. So in a sense, he owns this. But he also owns it in that <clears throat> Ian has responsibility for um, research and knowledge products at the at the college. So, Ian. Thank you very much, Director. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today on the second day of our Climate Justice Conference. Um, as you could tell, Dr. Spencer Thomas could have been presenting on any one of the days in any of the panels because he is one of the region's foremost climate consultants and will be attending uh, the World Climate Conference as he tends to do. Um, he actually does like um, the particular person that he pilloried a bit. <laughs> Uh, from the podium. Uh, thank you very much for your, your comments, Dr. Spencer. It is my duty to introduce the keynote speaker for this morning's plenary, uh, Mr. Lloyd Gardner, who I had the pleasure of missing completely at the airport a couple days ago, um, but we have met since then. He gave a presentation yesterday that was very profound, bringing together the ideas of climate, the science, but very importantly, the idea of climate justice, the importance of centering people um, in our discussion. So let me introduce Mr. Lloyd Gardner. Mr. Lloyd Gardner is an environmental planner who has been involved in environmental management in the wider Caribbean region, starting with the government of Jamaica in 1982. He became a consultant in 1992, providing consultant, consulting services to regional and international public, intergovernmental and civil society organizations. He is currently the executive director of the Foundation for Development 
Development Planning Incorporated. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us invite to the podium Mr. Lloyd Gardner. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Daniels, and thank you, colleagues, for the opportunity. Um, thanks, Dr. Henry, for inviting uh, myself and my organization to participate in this, in this process. Um, I'm going to get some help from technicians because I can't change um, the slides from here. So if what I'm going to try to do today is to sort of dive a little bit more into some of the issues we raised yesterday, again, so that we can see some of the specifics, things we say are normal but we don't necessarily like, um, and how climate sort of um, exacerbates um, some of these issues and what that means as we go forward for the public in general. As I said, just transitions is not just about the individual worker. These people live, um, play, associate in places, and so the spaces that they occupy are also important and must be considered within the context of just transitions. And so we will do both things. We will I will attempt to do both things, essentially to make some connections. And as you go through today's discussions, you will see how they apply or not. Um, and certainly as you go through your daily lives, you will see some of these things and hopefully be able to use them, not just in terms of your own activities and that of your family, but your organizations. And hopefully, as we hear, as you get more active, how you bring that into the public policy spaces, how you bring that into your institutions, and so we can actually move this agenda forward. So if I may start with, with, the, with the first slide, which is essentially just a recap of, of yesterday. It's just, just to remind you and put it in context for those of you who missed it. If for those that were here, then we will refresh a quick one. So if you just move to the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, as, as um, you heard a few minutes ago, the climate touches everything. It connects us um, individually, collectively. It connects us to, um, to the rest of the world in terms of the ecological systems. And therefore, what that means is that as we talk about climate, climate justice, climate impact, just transitions, all of those things need to be um, taken into account. So the climate is not just climate. Climate is what says is it's a drive of disaster risk. We're familiar with disasters of all kinds, um, and they're more unfolding, but it's a drive of disaster risk. Um, it prevents us from also dealing with some other issues that we have to deal with routinely, such as um, agriculture. We are, uh, we all in the Caribbean know about our import bills. We know how difficult it is, and if climate makes that worse, then clearly we are more vulnerable, not just individually, but as communities. Um, not just about the destruction in terms of climate impact, but also in terms of issues of heat. Now, do we eat the same uh, crops or do we have to change crops? Do we have to do more enrichment of our soils? What do we do about precipitation and water for our crops? So it, it, it makes life a little bit more complicated or for some of us a lot more complicated. But as we understand what, what the climate, the science is, what does it mean for the human and ecological systems? And I think that's what we need to see. We're seeing a lot and we're worrying about it, but these things are connected. And so again, the connections and the amplification of threats that climate bring to existing um, issues. So again, just to, okay, it's offline, so I will just quickly run through, through the list. Um, as I said, it exacerbates existing problems. It amplifies disparities that exist, um, especially access to resources, access to services, you know, health, education, et cetera, uh, et cetera. All disruptions do that, but climate is here on a long-term basis. It's going to be here way past our lifetimes, and it is getting worse as we saw last year and this year in terms of the number of wildfires globally, the number of places that are melting, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. Right? The number of floods and intensity of storms. So what I want to do now is just to switch gears. That was the intro. It's to switch gears quickly to what we know, 
on why we're not acting faster. Yesterday you heard, it's time to act as now. Um, and so if anybody knows the famous quote about no knowns and known unknowns and all of that stuff, well, we start with a little bit of humor. If you don't know, just ignore the heading. Um, you know, you, you <laughs> but we know, we have known for some time globally, um, this thing is seen as seen that, that climate change is one of the most immediate and significant consequences for small island states. For everyone, but for small island states, we are especially vulnerable for a number of reasons. Um, sea level rise, um, rain, rainfall. Um, for large continental spaces, rainfalls two countries away, you can still get some, some water. For us, a little shift, um, and we have no water on the land. We see, you know, showers passing us by. So it makes a difference in terms of migrating our ecological systems. Any, any, any change in terms of where we can grow food becomes really important, uh, just a mile or two here or, or there. So these kinds of things make it a little different, a lot different for islands and island systems. Um, how that handle, how that, what that means for our, our soil um, nutrient um, capabilities, um, also important. But the second part, uh, although this is taken directly from the report, sorry, go back, um, the highlight is mine. They didn't highlight this, so um, don't want to look at the document and say, ooh, you know, that's not what it said. I just did the highlight to, em to, to emphasize two things. The second part of that is, is the business of where most of our infrastructure and our people are located. And, be, and a lot of the Caribbean, we are located, most of our activities, infrastructure and our people in the narrow coastal zone, which is highly vulnerable. And so again, as you come back to what that means, um, not just for individually, but collectively, um, and the potential impact on our systems, it means that we have to start now just, not just thinking of changing how we do business, but actually migrating our infrastructure and our people away from the coastline. And we'll talk a little bit later about the fact that we're actually putting more things in the coastline, land is limited, but we have to actually start moving. We don't we put everything there and then try to find money to move them later on. The new things that we're putting in place, we can put them elsewhere. We don't have to keep adding in the coastline. A simple thing like that. Oh, it costs a lot of money to move populations and move primary infrastructure. Well, start by not putting any more in this space. You know, it, it seems obvious, but maybe not so. <laughs> so so we, we have this as a, as a sort of big thing to do. I mean, at the level of the country to move what has been built over, over centuries. Um, it seems difficult, but we start where we can. We do it simply. We don't need to find, you know, tens of billions of dollars. We can move things um, um, slowly over time. So the next slide. This the next slide, I've sort of highlighted everything because it is what we're talking about. Climate change, climate justice, climate, anything around climate is not just something that we deal with on its own. And uh, many years ago, people were coming to climate, mm, we don't have any time for that now. You know, climate change adaptation, well, we have more important things. We'll get to it in the next, you know, this thing not happening for the next 100 years, maybe 50, we'll get to it when we have time. Clearly, that is not the case. Um, we've known 2001 was 20, what, 20, 21, 20, almost 22 years ago when this report came out. Um, we've, and as it says, climate change involved complex interactions between climatic, environmental, economic, political, institutional, social, and technological processes. It cannot be addressed or comprehended in isolation of broader societal goals, such as equity or sustainable development, or other existing or probable future source of stress. One of the sources of stress that was known several years ago because it has happened, which came to being in 2020, was a pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic. We have had other epidemics and pandemics before. We have always worried about, you know, whether it's Zika or it is bird flu or it is something. Those kinds of, 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 of disruptions are known now. We don't know when it's going to, going to happen, but we know the impact of those disruptions. So on top of everything that's, that's happening, what this says is that your 
climate strategies, how you approach it, how you think about it, need to factor in all the other possible sources of stress because climate is going to make those things worse. Not because climate is driving them, Thank you. For those who are online, um, we just had a mic change, so my apologies. But the question I wanted to, to, to raise for all of us is, since we have known this for at least two decades, what have we done? Um, and you heard yesterday from Dr. Rankin, and as repeated by Dr. Thomas, there's an urgency to this because it takes a minute to move a, a whole community, it takes a minute to move a nation, not to mention a planet. And so we need to actually get started, not individually, not in our little groups, but in a much more collective, in a much more serious, serious way. And so I want to, as we move rapidly to action, as the funding, as you hear, comes online in many spaces, what do we do with it? Do we just spend money because we need economic activity or do we actually mobilize funding, technical skills, technology, towards common goals, toward an agreed solution. Um, and so some of the stuff I want to touch on is what is happening, how it connects, and therefore how we can move forward to answer the question, what next and who does it? Um, hopefully I'll be able to do some of that. I'll give some ideas on possibilities. The next slide talks about, again, we touched on that yesterday. And so I just want to remind you essentially what some of the things I'm going to focus on for the next 15 minutes, um, I, I think. So for the next slide, please. Um, yesterday, we talked about these things, governance and what that means in terms of how, what is decision making looks like. Um, and the fact that a number of the, the disparities we're seeing, a number of the inequities, a number of the injustices are actually tied into, locked into our decision making processes. Um, we'll, we'll look at that issue of access to resources and the normal social justice issues, the normal social issues around allocation of resources through the many processes we, we, we use, whether through the government or, or elsewhere. Access to goods and services we mentioned, you know, for healthcare, education, the rest of it, fire prevention, whatever it may be. Quality of spaces, um, we'll get into a, a bit, and, and, and wealth. Um, Part of everything else is about wealth generation and wealth transfer. Um, it's about accumulation of power, wealth. Um, there's some other issues inside there, but it's central about power and, and, and wealth at the end of the day, whether we seek to have it or we want to maintain it or want to prevent others um, from having it. And as part of that process, the issue of what, appropriation of rights and, and properties, intellectual property, you heard about the indigenous, um, that particular case study yesterday, and that is happening all over the world. Um, and I want to just say right here, just to make a point right here in terms of the appropriation of rights and properties. Traditional indigenous, we've always had that. Moving people, stealing their intellectual property and their knowledge and you know, doing patents and other things elsewhere. But that is still happening, not just in, in, in South Dakota. But as we buy EVs, electric vehicles, all of the minerals, all of the things that are required, as you know, we, we, we're moving, we're, we're decarbonizing, and we're moving to this new thing. But the process of doing that and the resources need to, to make that happen involves in and of itself movement of people and treating certain groups in the way we have treated them in the past. 
And so I keep that in mind. Now, whether or not we extend John transition from our needs and our community to other communities, if we believe that it should happen for us, do we get involved in a process? Do we support certain strategies that actually create injustices elsewhere because of our needs? I'm not saying you have to take that on. I'm just saying that if we believe this, we have to keep in mind as a community, it's not just our group, our country, as a global community, as people, what does trust changes and mean not just for us, but in terms of for other people based on our demand? Because that's what we complain about, that people in the north or wherever it is have this demand, this consumption level, these things, and they create injustices here. We don't want what we do to create injustice elsewhere. At least I hope we don't want that. So let's keep those kinds of things in, in, in mind and, and as we move forward. So I will just touch on a couple of these and try to, to keep them together as we move forward so I don't waste too much of your time. The next, so governance and, and, and governing and governance. I'm going to highlight about six points very quickly inside here. Um, but if you get a chance, if you can read the statement, fine. If not, um, I hope it's brought big enough for you to read it. And I'll just flag a couple of things. First that I want to highlight is governance is a participative process. A number of groups well, you know, talk about you know, participatory decision making and, and shared governance and, and all of these things. Um, that's what this is saying this quotation is saying um, that we need groups, individuals, the needs of supporting process. And so later on, a few slides, we'll talk about what that means, not what it means, but what it takes to support it. Now, one of the issues we have in talking about um, what strategies, how, which voices are heard, which voices determine what we do the process we use requires action policies, institutional processes, institutional support. It requires infrastructure, social infrastructure to support participation by all of our groups. It requires sharing information. It requires making sure people understand the choices that are before them. If we don't do that, then clearly we are building into our governing systems injustice in the governing system. If people don't understand what is ahead and the choices that they make, then you can't use words like justice and fairness and knowledge if they don't have those things. So I just want to flag that, that first one. The second thing I want, I want to flag is collective decision making. Again, we do participation by consultation. Somebody makes a decision, they make their choices, they come and say, what do you think about the thing that we have already decided? Clearly, <laughs> that is not what we're trying to get here. Okay. How do we frame an issue? What it is we need to look at as a community? What are the options? What's the data? Who has the data? What does it mean for different people? Even if my group gets hit hard, but maybe if my neighbor gets off better, I have a better life because my neighbor has a better life. Maybe in a storm, that's whose house I need to run to. So the person better have a good house, not just my house, that's important. If I lose my roof, maybe I need to go next door or two doors down, you know. If they're doing okay, maybe we will all look out for each other so that crime goes down or whatever it is we need to do as a group. But how do you capture that as a collective? How do you make decisions? It's not the easiest thing, as we all know, even in a small group. We know that. But we have to actually provide the resources and the mechanisms as a matter of public policy and collective action to do that. Otherwise, you gain reinforcing injustices because some groups are not going to actually have a say in this process and might actually get left out. So again, I wanted to, to flag that. Third thing I want to flag is the redesign of policies and institutions. Nobody moves institutions. You don't turn them around. You don't we, we, we play around the edges. We do a little resign. We bring them up to whatever the new term is, you know. Um, and we use the new buzzwords, but we're really not changing the institutional cultures. 
really not changing institutional designs. We have institutions that were designed for a particular purpose decades and decades ago. Things have changed. This climate is changing stuff. The way the global economy works has changed to some extent. Not the big, you know, who makes the decisions globally and the power, the power structure, but the economies have changed and it's changing. And so our institutions able to actually deal with our reality in terms of moving people forward. Are they ready for just transitions? Are they ready to fight for justice? And actually globally, we're seeing it moving in the other direction. So what do we do in the Caribbean? So again, our policies, not just more of the same, our institutions and our institutional cultures need to change. Now, I hope we don't have to try to change all our leaders in that process, but sometimes <laughs> we need to, that's part of institutional change and this redesign. I hope we don't all have to do that because we have leaders that want to get the work done. So we need to find the right ones. That's part of the, the redesign, finding the right people, asking the right questions, making sure we understand what happened, uh, what needs to be done and asking those questions. That's part of the redesign. So knowledge, knowledge management, knowledge sharing, whether as collectives or through however we get it, we need, we need, we need to do that. Um, what it means therefore is that institutions and groups need to make sure that their members understand this. This is part of just changes and that the, it's, you represent a group, but we need your members to talk to you, the leadership, about what this means for them, their desires, their needs, how they participate in this process, so that when you step out and represent them, you're actually representing them. You understand that, okay? So some of the just transitions, not just about what people are doing to us, <laughs> but how we're dealing within our, our groups, our families, our communities. So please keep that in mind for those of you who are part of collectives. Um, the next thing I want to, to highlight is the issue of mutual roles and responsibilities in implementation. You know, we say the private sector is the engine of, 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 of growth, and we leave it up to them to get on with it, and we'll give them whatever incentives, you know, to make that happen. And people say the government is in charge of fixing everything, providing the enabling environment and making sure things work. And we, 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 it's, that's their thing. We don't have time for that. You know, if you want to get involved, you must get into um, representational politics. Well, well, not true. Government is there for a purpose. And as this, as we're going to say later on, government is, has a role. It doesn't deal with everything in our lives. We know that. They don't tell us which church to go to. They don't tell us who to associate with. There are some things that they do, but there are some things they do because we don't have a lot of other um, spaces in which an institution should do it. We join community groups we, we, you know, for, for different reasons, and that's because of we join collectives, whatever that collective looks like, to organize our lives in certain ways for certain purposes. So all of these organizations, this collective needs to be brought into the process towards shared goals. Otherwise, we're not mobilizing all our resources or talents towards a collective vision of what that could be. So the issue of how we actually decide on those roles, and governments are very mindful, I want to be nice, um, of their power. They don't let too many other people in the mutual responsibility business. It's, it's not a done thing. Um, even within the private sector, everybody, they're not all honky dory friends. I mean, it's very competitive, protecting whatever space there. All of the groups do it. Civil society is everywhere. But clearly, we have to have a discussion around this in terms of not just moving the sector or your collective, but also in terms of how we work to move society forward. Um, don't want to overstate it, but it's, it's hard not to. Um, the other one is about governance in ways to relate to ways in which society solves this problem collectively. So again, um, if you're going to solve the problem, you need to work together, but it needs to be collectively. We can't say, well, we've done our input, we've gone, we've elected a particular portion, or we've selected a leader of this group. Let them get on with it. We need to get back to reality and our lives. What is your lives they're out making decisions about? 
And so we need to stay involved in the process. The last piece is something that nobody likes to hear. Um, government merely as one instrument in, in the process of community development is one. We need to hold them accountable. Yes, we choose who these people are, or we at least get a chance to try to choose who these people are. We need to hold them accountable. But there's just one. Let's not get lazy. We can't say it's a government's thing to do when we only talk to them once every four years. And when they come to us, we want to know what they're coming with. Not what we're doing that we need them to manage on our behalf, but what they're coming with. And so again, it comes back to how we see ourselves, how we organize our work. We don't have to know everything. Clearly, that's not going to happen. That's not possible for one person to know everything. But we congregate in different spaces. We talk, but as barbershop or as church or as something else, someplace else, we talk. So we need to figure out how we organize those other institutions and spaces to solve collective problems, not just to complain, not just to the personal stuff, but to solve the things we need to do as we move forward, given the threat we hear we face. We can't just always know going to talk sports. We talk a little sports, we talk a little politics. Now we need to add one more thing to it. What do we do about X or Y? And as we see this week, and as you have experienced a lot this year and other years in the past, basic things like how we get rid of water running on the street, we kind of need to have a discourse around it. Every country in the Caribbean, a lot of places in the world, we're seeing it in a lot of places. So I, I spent, I think, too much time on that one, but I needed this governance piece sort of touch on. Um, where's Doc? He's missing. Um, in his stead, can I, I'm going to ask um, for a few more minutes because I'm very close to, to time, but I wanted to, to touch on this a little bit. The next one is wealth creation and transfer. Again, how do we do this normally? And, 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 and there are a number of ways in which people get access to resources. Government budgets, you focus on priorities. Um, your procurement, there are certain groups that have access, certain groups based on the capabilities of the groups. Um, access to financing, as we all know, whether we're looking for business loans or anything else, different, you know, especially community groups, there are certain parameters, certain conditions you have to meet and certain things you have to do to have access to them. Incentive programs, um, when you target certain kinds of industries or certain kind of activities or certain groups to do certain things, you provide incentives. Um, you limit through resource management on other ways, access to fisheries to certain kinds of resources. As you know in the Trinidad in the past, in a drought, and people are over pumping from wells, the government tells you, well, maybe you shouldn't do that during this period or the limit how much water you can take off wells. Not just Trinidad, it's every place, but you may remember that from previous droughts. So even something that you think is natural or full, you have limited access to it under certain conditions and climate change is going to make that worse for certain, certain peers, for certain resources, for certain times. And so how we do that um, will determine who has access and therefore how their lives move forward. Intellectual property, we have touched on that before. I think yesterday somebody mentioned um, the movement of genetic material. We have always had that issue and that's one of the things the Caribbean need, need to work with. But we have always understood the idea that we lose access to things we own, whether it's writing, or is music that is composed, or is something else that's patented. Something as obvious as the pan. Somebody north, several years ago, tried to patent. I mean, the pan is, everybody knows that it was done in Trinidad, but no, 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 somebody, because it wasn't patented, somebody tried to do that. Something that obvious. So you can imagine the things we don't know, but the information we share, and we're very casual and careless how we share things we create especially the written word or music or things, we share it. And, and the different social media platforms encourage us to do that. But then somebody monetizes it. Where is our share of the profits? How do we do that? How do we use those individually and collectively to do the things we, we, we need to do? Yes, that, that's some damage. Yes, somebody caused a problem and we need some more resources, but we are giving away assets that we can actually use 
for either individually or collectively. Risk transfer, um, again, as we encourage certain business practices, certain industries, we provide not just incentives for them to do things, but some of those incentives transfer risk and damage to the community. You take an air out of non-natural setting and you make it into a hard surface, a hotel, a dam, a marina, whatever it is, you're transferring an asset to private ownership. You have to make sure that that transfer of asset doesn't come with more liabilities than benefits. The environmental damage it may cause, the loss of access to by a community, the place you used to go to sort of relax, commune with nature, feel, relax, feel, you know, whatever it is you're doing, that place is now used for something else. Maybe for public use, maybe not. And so what does that mean in terms of loss of spaces as we go forward? For workers, disposable income, um, financial literacy, support systems, whether it is job training as we switch from, you know, whatever it is to elect diesel to electric, or it is, you know, focus on some edit program um, that requires some more learning or access to technology, whatever it is, what are the support systems in place? And those cannot be just in the government must go do a retraining program someplace. All of us, as we take our, our members and our institutions and our individuals through that need to be able to think about it before we actually move um, because it takes a while normally to actually put the support systems in place the disposable income we all know that if we have money we can do a lot more things with it but as we look at who workers are and we look at the way in which the ink and we think about the income that those different groups have what does it mean to have a what as they say in the north a livable wage versus you know real disposable income um, if we get ill, if we don't have access to resources, what does it mean to have disposable income that's eaten up very quickly by all the services that we need to access? Um, is it really what we need to have a just future? And the last piece is equitable infrastructure. And I mentioned this um, because on the next slide, I'm going to show, for those of you who know, fine. For those of you who don't think about it a little and I'll explain it just in a few minutes. So the next slides, I want to show this graphic. It basically suggests that there are different types of infrastructure. When you say infrastructure, people think road bridges, whatever it is. But if you think about, um, and in the center, that tree represents basically what is called natural infrastructure. The thing the World Bank say is one of the wealth, the sources of wealth for nations, your natural systems. Not natural resources as in oil and gas and bauxite, but your natural systems, your ecosystems, the things that provide clean air, clean water, whatever it is. We say goods and services that sustain life. Okay, natural systems. So we think about it as one of the infrastructure things because it provides things that we, we need as a society. We know that infrastructure overall can provide, is, it bring a lot of benefits, but it also creates harm. The case study yesterday sh showed that to all of us who saw it in terms of we need to do certain things, you impact people because you need certain things for the infrastructure. And we have known that as long as we have moved communities, um, we take land by eminent domain, we do all kinds of things, some of which is supposed to be for public benefit, but it can actually create harm um, to different groups or to individuals. So we want to be careful about what this graphics says um, and there's a, a URL there there's a, a, a link it shows where you can find a nice little blog but a document a report is actually at the end of that so I would encourage all of us to read it because it talks about it links social with, with hard infrastructure with a participatory process we spoke about earlier for governance what does it mean to support that um, and all of the things you need to support decision making and communal um, decision making is infrastructure. It requires systems to be in place. It requires support from people who manage these processes. It requires a commitment from the actors in, in, in that space. Uh, and therefore, if you don't maintain those systems that support that infrastructure, it falls apart. Um, it, it's a lot of work um, and a lot of people don't like it, but if, to move to a just future, we need to have that done. Next, if I may. There are a couple more, but I want to, I'll, I'll want to spend a little bit on, the, on a few of these and then um, 
try to, to wrap up after that. I'm way over time. I'm going to get marked down by my colleagues. Um, but the quickly, some of these, I think you know, resources, access to, to, to food, air, water, and the things we do and how those reduce access um, by pollution, by overuse, by, you know, so whether your fishes, your clean water, your land, how the, what it is in terms of the availability and the quality and how climate change actually um, makes some of that worse, both in terms of access and in terms of the quality of, of our resources. A place of work, a lot of what um, certainly Cipriana does and what the unions and our collectives is look, look, focus on workers in terms of their worst place of work. You know, what are conditions that will uh, reduce harm? Um, what kind of clothes, safety, clothing you need? Whatever it is, the health conditions. Um, but if we move place of work to outdoors, um, you find that the standards are a little less defined. Um, what does it mean when outdoors get so hot that you start collapsing outdoors? What if you're ill and a lot of the Caribbean um, or levels of well, our level of health is not as great as we'd like it to be, high levels of um, non-communicable diseases and these other line issues. When you stress your body and you have these issues and you stress your body inside or outside, what does that mean? What does it mean if your job is to move things from place to place. Um, you out deliver your delivery person, or you, you know, you call out in an emergency. What, what happens if the conditions outdoors have changed so radically that you can work for fair fewers outdoors? What kind of clothes you wear? Is your employer or your group or your family? How does that? What does that mean? Do we have to change the hours we work um, to reduce the impact? Of, 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 of climate and, and, and heat on our, on our systems. And on the foods we supply, on the goods we supply. Some of the stuff you get that read, you know, um, room temperature, keep at room temperature. Is room temperature, <laughs> is it 70? Or is it no 90 half of the year, 90 degrees? What does that mean for even those, those kinds of things? But the one I want to, 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 well, before I move to that, the issue of losing spaces, where we gather, we sit by the sea, we look, we feel good, we relax. We go out in the forest, we walk, whatever, wherever it is, whatever green space we use, landscapes, um, seascapes, wherever. We, we commune, we gather in spaces, whether it's in market or the barber shop or the ball field on Sunday morning or Saturday afternoon, wherever it is, there are communal spaces. Some are around traditional practices, some are not but we stay connected to our neighbors and to each other because we have communal spaces and we lose some of those routinely. They're impacted in storms, they're flooded, they're damaged in ways, and we damage them by our actions in terms of how we behave. Um, we sell them, we exchange them. And a lot of the things we're losing is places of spiritual communion, whatever that is. For me, personally, it is about sitting and reconnecting to the natural around me. Sometimes it's visual, sometimes I need to be physically in this space to reconnect. It helps me to calm, to rebalance. Some people need that more than others. And every place doesn't do that for me. So if I lose my place, it affects me. It doesn't necessarily affect you. What is your space? Is there a communal space that does the same thing for a larger group, not just one individual? And so you have to find those spaces because there is more evidence. We knew, forgot, and we were learning that our connection to the natural world helps us in terms of our health, mental and emotional and physical health. So what does it mean when you lose that connection? The quality of the space and access to the space and we keep changing all those things, we keep losing them. So again, does, does transition mean how we maintain the health and the emotional integrity of the individual, not just the individual worker, but the individual, and how does that translate to the community? Okay, climate makes whatever we're doing a little worse. It creates new problems. And so in transition, we have to address the way we do business now, not just to reduce harm, but to actually rebalance us completely. 
even if climate wasn't there, we would need to do some rebalancing. Climate just adds a dimension to that. And so as we go through this transition, what does that mean for us? On this, um, Dr. Henry, I, I, know, I know you're going to stop me in a few minutes, but I want to touch on whom for, for a particular reason. Where we live is important for all kinds of reasons. And so we have, as we are being reminded this week, as a matter of public policy, globally, we have put people of lesser means in the most vulnerable places, close to the factory, close to the dump, in flood plains, because land is cheap, we can build a lot of them at very low price. So sometimes even our building design is not what we use everywhere. So there's a level of vulnerability that we have created over time. This is human beings for the most vulnerable amongst us. Climate change with a level of, let's say extreme rainfall events, we're seeing now that those people in those vulnerable places are becoming even more vulnerable. So as you heard yesterday, the vulnerable groups are getting larger because of the impacts of climate change. And so if we talk about just transitions, so a lot of people, we're going to have to move. It's not just about infrastructure now in terms of our roads and things. A lot of people we're going to have to make less vulnerable as a matter of course, as we move forward. But to show you all sometimes this is just because we work in silos, we think in silos, we solve problems one at a time. For many, many, many last few decades, let's say for last few decades, one of the things that happens is that we have really, we hit hard, got hit hard by a number of hurricanes, really bad, lots of damage. And so we have taken people out of supposedly more vulnerable buildings, you know, whatever, their board house, whatever it is, you know, buildings not built to certain standards, and we build concrete buildings for them because we have to here yeah, build better in terms of housing, we build concrete things. But from the public sector perspective, we don't have necessarily resources to do it. We need to do it for a lot of people. We need to do it fast after they're destroyed. So if you've seen across the region, it's not the only place in the world, but if you've seen across the region, these small concrete buildings um, that have proliferated. And you know, politicians, we need to build X number of thousands of houses by X date and, and they get it done. But if you notice a number of those places are riverbanks, flood plains beside the mangrove swamp in the coastal area. We are building tens of thousands of houses in some of the most vulnerable locations in our countries. Okay. So we are now not only, so climate is not just the problem, the all social injustices, the way we do, we make decisions. Traditionally, we are applying it now when the conditions have changed. And so as we think through just transition, we can't talk about just traditional knowledge anymore or what we used to do or what used to work. We have to rethink a simple thing like, yes, we need to provide housing. We need to provide it fast. We need to provide shelter because people's houses are damaged, but we cannot put them necessarily in all the spaces that are available because some of those spaces are more exposed than others. We don't want to solve one problem and create several others. I mentioned concrete house because one of the problems that as things get hotter, you heard Dr. Rankin yesterday, if you were there, if not, you might have heard it or read it someplace, that one of the issues is the number of hot nights and your bodies need to cool. Human beings evolve in a certain temperature range. That's why you get heat stroke, you drop down, you're dead. Yes, we have to keep it. I want to tell you, I must go cool off and they start putting in misting stations and you're seeing people in the news jumping into fountains in some places. Your body needs to cool down. And one of the times and places does that is at night. If we have hotter nights, more hotter nights, your body isn't cooling. What does that mean for you next day? At work, at play, are you more irritable, less irritable? Can you function? Can you even think? And so it is not just your productivity, but as a human being, 
it means now you're more stressed. So have we now solved your housing problem, but may give you some long-term health problems that now rebound in a negative way to the community? What does just transition mean as we take people out of from stand damage, but put them in another vulnerable space? So we have to really think through our policies and our actions and not function on the fly. That means more deliberation, longer forward planning, more groups thinking about it, and a better allocation of public and private resources. It's not just a public sector problem in terms of the government. This is a societal problem. So we need to think through what just transition mean for us. When people are talking to, we're solving these problems, we're doing resilience, we're doing sustainability. But let's think it through and make sure that in solving one problem, we do not create others. Okay. So I, I really needed to touch on the housing because a lot of houses are going up in the wrong places, it seems. Um, and I wanted to bring that other dimension in terms of the health and the long-term impact in terms of our, our communities individually and collectively. Um, quickly, what is work? Um, so the next slide I want to, sorry, before you get to worker, what is work? Um, there's a definition, a very simple definition that I've sort of adapted. It says mental or physical effort to achieve a result. Um, and we throw on terms like forced work, as we know, there's people doing all kinds of bad things to people in, in places. Uncompensated work, um, part of how we grew up with who takes care of family, taking care of one, or caregiving in, in its various forms. Uh, Okay, I thought it was somebody telling me to, to stand down. Um, on uncompensated work, we use words like livable wage, whatever that means. And does that matter now when, you know, we have so many disruptions and we have to, to fix things? Decent work, again, ILO will tell us what that means in a few minutes, I think, um, how they define decent work. Green jobs, that's in the ILO's district. And I hear a lot of people talking about green jobs as if work is different if it's green versus some other color. I, I, I am not sure. But um, the conditions under which we work seem to be important. So I, I don't know what green jobs mean, why that is you know, special for a worker uh, versus some other job. We use words like you know, employee versus contractor, full-time versus part-time, permanent versus temporary. And those have uh, different meanings on the law, um, in business, in communities, all of those things, even in the civil society sector. So who is a worker under all of those definitions? Um, all are treated, um, all workers are not treated equally, regardless of where you think they, 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 they fall. And the differences are, create different invulnerabilities in, in these different groups is, Let's take the first, a small, a small older farmer who uses his family or her family, um, or they share labor. You know, you plant on my field today, all of us go next day and, and so on and so forth. The old ways in which we used to do this. But if that person is paid, is that no person now a laborer and an, 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 an employee versus if we share labor? Are you no longer a worker if you work in your own farm? And so how do we treat that person? What kind of support systems are in place? So when we talk about worker, it is not just workers that are employees. When we know this, um, but we need to, to keep it in mind. Independent contractors, self-employed, people, sole proprietors, freelancers, a group of growing group of people that uh, companies are using, governments, a lot of people like them because they don't have to provide any support system for them. They don't have to deal with things like you know, pensions and health schemes and all of those things so like them. But what does it mean if the disruption in your community is such that you do not have the resources or you cannot, over time, accumulate the resources to take care of your health and the health of your family? If at the individual or family level, you, not, you can't muster enough financial or other assets handle it. Do we still use these categories of, categories of workers with their vulnerabilities because it is better for the economy or for my bottom line as a private company or for the government if they are no more vulnerable 
And so we need to think through these kinds of things. And in, 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 in the number of places to talk about these gig workers and remote, or oh, another pandemic, or oh, remote worker became the thing. Um, but some of the remote workers were actually subsidizing these companies because they, if you, you might get a computer if you're lucky, but then they don't have no connectivity. So you now have to go get a contract with your local provider to do work. It's not your work you're doing. They didn't, the, the company isn't actually paying the subscription to the, to the, the cable company and all the equipment that goes with it. And who babysits while you're doing remote work? Who picks up the, if you have children at school, who does what? So there's a lot of burden that's been passed onto workers under these different categories and these new ways of doing business. And the question is, does that, is that worker more vulnerable? Does that mean that because they're not our employees, we have no responsibility for them and therefore we don't need to consider them in a just transition framework? What does that look like? Um, the building wealth is not just about pension schemes and, and, and retirement um, things. It's about having people understand how to use um, all of the systems that are available to them to not just save. You know, we, we've set a little aside, but it's more than that, especially if there are these disruptions. But one of the things um, I'm sure the collectives, whether they are credit unions or labor unions, um, is how you mobilize the power of the collective to build wealth on behalf of your members. And I'm sure people who are in the business are beginning if they have not considered it in the new dispensation in the things where people are more vulnerable as we do this transition. It is not no snow getting work and securing work. It's about how you do you build wealth. Um, and I think we have a responsibility as not we, I'm not a leader of a collective um, of, of that kind of collective, um, but how do we do that? There are some special cases for workers I want to touch on quickly, and I'm like choosing two people's um, presentation spaces. Civil society organizations are treated differently for some reason. Um, well, we, we know some of the reasons, but their workers are also treated differently. We don't expect them to be paid as well as other places. So we don't. They don't have certain kind of benefits because we can't afford it or because somehow we don't think they need it. A lot of them are volunteers and clearly not workers, they're just volunteers. They spend half their time with you, but somehow they're not workers. Um, they contribute to the growth of the society, but they're not. And we don't allow civil society into the spaces for decision making normally. Trinidad had last year or the year before under the OECD rules, a new law passed for civil society. That was tremendously onerous. The private companies didn't have to do some of the things that these civil society organizations and community groups had to do. And so you can't talk about justice when your public benefit organizations, your civic organizations are held to a much higher, much more rigorous standard than the rest of us that support some of the things we do. And certainly, what do we mean um, by retirees? Is a retiree a worker? And how do we prepare for retirement? Clearly, that person is a current worker but we need to make sure that the worker is not, you're not just responsible for the worker when they're working, but their future as well. Otherwise we have, we're doing great disservice to them. Um, last point on this is this issue of micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, and from the slide, that's just grabbing a case from statement from the um, Caribbean Development Bank report that talks about the importance of small and micro businesses to the Caribbean. But if you look at the enabling environment, all of the support systems, all of the laws that support, we provide incentives to big companies and to certain kind of groups. But these small businesses that account for actually, as this is, up to 85% of businesses, GDP, large numbers of businesses, and from some minor to ownership of or for special groups, is the support system in place? Do they get the same access? Do they get the same support? Do they get the same policy support? Um, and, and so just transitions must also redress some of those injustices. So the question is, is just transition a new framework that explores all of this and changes the way we organize our business, or is it within the old paradigm? Are we just protecting workers within an old paradigm, or is just transitions a new way of looking how we organize ourselves as we move forward? 
that's a question for all of us individually and collectively to answer. Um, I, I don't want to get slapped around later by ILO, so I'm not going to go down that road. I'm just, just asking. Um, some of the, the current decision-making processes that address economic strategies, um, how likely, given what we said before, we knew some of this in 2020, in 2001, that it need to be a collective, it need to be, we need, need to work on things, that there were these inequalities that were being generated. What does that mean in terms of move for, moving forward? Can we trust the people that we have left to take care of business, whichever sphere of work they are in, to understand that and move it, or do we need to get involved? And what Dr. Rankin said yesterday, and you heard again this morning, you have to get involved individually. Otherwise, the system doesn't work in the way you want it to. Um, there are all kinds of actors, and so the question is, what's the best process, or what are the likely processes that must be put in place? What are the support systems? What are the laws? What are the instruments? What are the people? How do we expect them to function? What are the process? What are the, the institutional cultures that need to support it? And we have to identify them process by process, stage by stage, and make sure that transition is not a one-off thing where tomorrow we have a just transition thing and we pass a law and it happens. It's going to be a long-term process that require attention and work all the way through. Are we prepared for that work? We have to be. Thank you for putting up with my very long overtime presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner, for that presentation. I was standing on the side there making notes busily, and then uh, somewhere around halfway through, I realized it was very simple. Uh, Mr. Gardner's presentation, for all of its breadth, um, made a simple point. Climate is context. The problem is ours. It's about us. It's about the decisions that we make, the choices that we make. Um, and all of those problems already exist. They existed before the climate became the problem that we are now operating in. They are the decisions that we've been struggling with since our societies came into existence. Now we have a new context within which we must think about those same issues, but it still comes down to us getting involved and taking action acting collectively. Uh, it was long, but it was, I think, necessary to go through this process to help us focus on the issue of the conference itself. Climate is context. The problems are ours. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Gardner. So we will be going to our uh, simultaneous sessions at about 10.45 because of how long we've run over. Those sessions will be on ILO guidelines on just transitions and international standards in waste management. Um, and as I said, they will take off at around 10.45. Thank you so much for being with us here. Uh, Sadika, which room? Uh, East Wing for the waste management is right here in the auditorium. So I guess those of you who are in the room will hear that the coffee and refreshments are outside in the foyer of the auditorium. So thank you very much for being here. I want to add my thanks um, to the directors for all of the people who presented yesterday and let us hope that we have good as good a day today as yesterday was. Thank you very much.